morning, everybody. Here we go again. The wheel turns around once again, and we are having some programming difficulties here, which I want to get into for a couple of seconds, because I know there is nothing more uh, disturbing than to read in the, in, the, in, the, in the listings of the paper or the magazines. Well, something that's going to be on, you want to watch it, and then it doesn't come on, and you say, well, what, what are those people doing? Tomorrow night, we had advertised that Monty Hall was going to be on the air. We taped the show last Friday night here in New York to accommodate Mr. Hall's schedule. We're not going to run that show. We're going to run instead the regular show that we're going to do here tomorrow night with Larry Flint, the publisher of Hustler magazine. We'll have his uh, lawyer, Mr. Charles Faringer, who we had on the telephone. And I'm, I'm sure I don't have to repeat it, but uh, Flint was uh, convicted of uh, obscenity and other charges in Cincinnati, sentenced to jail, went to jail, came back out. He's now on appeal. So he and his attorney will be here to talk about this whole business of the First Amendment and what is the right to publish and what is not. And also with him will be California Congressman Robert Dornan. Now, I don't want to say that Mr. Dornan is a conservative, but I think that he is to the right of Barry Goldwater, okay? You kind of get the picture. Notice I say, I think. I used to watch his programs out in Los Angeles. He's a very conservative man. He has some very definite ideas on pornography and its distribution in communities. So we will do that tomorrow night because of its topicality. The Monty Hall program will appear on Thursday night, the 10th of March, uh, that week, which is the week of March the 6th. Why am I going into all of this? It's a vacation week. We're not going to be here, and all the shows are going to be on tape. Okay. Tonight, we were going to have Steve Coffin here because, uh, or no, last night we were going to have him here, and he didn't show up. We were going to do a whole show tonight on artificial insemination. And this morning, a woman who is pregnant by artificial insemination, who was going to be here to talk about what her hopes were and why she went through the process and all the ramifications, called up and said, I, I, what, she doesn't feel well or she doesn't want to do it or whatever the reason. What was it? Her husband didn't want to do it. Okay, we understand. But now here we are at 10 o'clock in the morning, about eight hours away from airtime in New York, uh, tape time in New York. What are you going to do? So we pull this whole show apart tonight to try and put on something that all of you will watch because it's late and we appreciate the business. And uh, last night, we were going to have Steve Coffin on, and he wasn't here because he called up at 8 o'clock in the morning or some such hour and said, look, I don't want to do it. And Monday, we had a guest fall out at 10.30 in the morning, and it's been a terrible, terrible week here, I don't mind telling you. And staff gets involved in trying to get people, and when you do things at the last minute, oftentimes it doesn't turn out the way it should. And then I get upset with them, and they with me, and so it's been a terrible week, and, and I'm sorry if the listings aren't right, and, uh, and that's why. What we're going to do tonight is we have a man coming on who's going to give us a, a fast 10 minutes on biorhythm. We've been through that before, but he's got some great charts, and we have 10 dynamite minutes with him and out the door. <laughs> this is the way it was explained to me, uh, and his name is Bernard Gittles. And then we have Dennis Smith, the guy who wrote a great book, Engine Company, uh, a report from Engine Company 82. He is the interview in Penthouse Magazine this month. Uh, he's got a lot of money, but he still fights fires, and he'll be with us for, uh, oh, 20 or 25 minutes and out the door. And then we will get around to Dr. Ronald Erickson, who has developed a way, he claims, to isolate uh, the Y element in human sperm, which, if used to artificially inseminate a female, will more often than not produce male children. This is for people who want sons. And then joining us will be Dr. Joseph Fletcher, who is the director of the biggest sperm bank in the world, and we'll find out how that works. And I know you could snicker about it, and I probably will, but not now. And out the door. And then I'll come back and remind you about next week's programming, and then we're all going to get out the door. So that's what we're going to do tonight. I'll tell you, that's a hell of a way to run a railroad, but we're doing the best we can. We'll be right back then with uh, Mr. Gittleson, and we'll talk about the, uh, the biorhythm system and look at the famous charts of famous people. So please don't go away, because we'll be right back. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Mr. Bernard Gittleson, who is an expert on human biorhythm. He calls it a personal science that enables us all to chart our emotional, physical, and intellectual conditions on any given day, thus preparing us for all kinds of personal misfortune and giving us the opportunity to get ready for same. Mr. Gittleson, thank you for coming in on short notice. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, briefly, biorhythm, if you just define that, because we've done some programs on it, but we've yeah. picked up some new viewers. Uh, biorhythm is a study of uh, three cycles that start from the day we're born a 23-day physical, a 28-day emotional, and a 33-day intellectual. Mm -hmm. They go up and down for the rest of our lives, which account for some of the days that are great. And there are some of the days you're pushing, as you were describing early in the program, some of the days that are real tough. Right. Now, does this remain constant for one's lifetime, it 33, remains constant. 28, and 23? It remains constant. The only time it's interrupted, such as in jet lag, you know 
you're completely out of sync. Surely. And then within a day or two, you get back into sync, and your biorhythm continues right back the way it was, had it not been interrupted. All right. This audience is well aware with the air crash that took place at JFK uh, last June, or uh, June 24th of 75, in which 112 people were killed, and you have the biorhythm chart of the, uh, the captain on board the aircraft. Yes, I here is his chart. Now, three planes tried to come in within seconds, and the first pilot decided to go uh, into a holding pattern. The second pilot decided to go on to Newark. That's correct. The third man decided to chance it. He was on an intellectual critical day. There is the exact point. Now, there are only six critical days a month, a pilot only has to fly 17, and part of my crusade is to get airlines not to fly pilots on their critical days. Of the last 12 major airplane crashes, 11 of the 12, either the pilot or the pilot and the co-pilot, were on critical days. What determines uh, the amount of, there's no such word as criticality, but I'm stuck with it. Well, it's when you're How going do you know from, when day is critical? When you're going from top to bottom or bottom to top, if you're driving a car with a gear shift, when you're going from first to second, for a split second, your car isn't under control. That's correct. That's the same thing that happens to our body. When we are positive and we're going into a negative or from a negative to a positive, for 24 hours, we're not in control. Mm -hmm. Yet, it's, it's curious to note that the crash did not take place when he was really at a bottom point right no, here. No, this is weakness, this is strength, mm -hmm. and this is lack of coordination. Oh, I see. So it's that critical period. That critical and period. What, what determines the value of this line? This is the exact center. In fact, today I was talking to uh, uh, the ex-president of the uh, National Safety Foundation who did a study of 300 helicopter crashes and found that in most of the crashes they were on critical days. 80% mm -hmm. of the accidents happened on only 20% of the days. This is what is vital. Do we know if there are any airlines who actually use this system right I now? know of several airlines that are using it. However, none of them have admitted it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I understand because I think uh, I wouldn't accept any theory uh, unless I tested it for five years myself. And mm -hmm. I think they're testing it out, and eventually I think all of the airlines will say we're using it, just like all of the cars are now using seatbelts. Right. But it took 20 years. You, you know, long before I heard of biorhythm, I heard a story there was a, a, a plane crash, and they went back and they checked the flight crew, and they found out that that morning there had been an emotional trauma in the pilot's life, and there had been some financial trouble in the co-pilot's life, uh, there had been some stress in the flight engineer's flight. Three members of the cabin crew had difficulties. And they said, given the emotional circumstances of all those people who came together at that one place in time for reasons we know not, there was no way they could have gotten that aircraft off the ground that day. Well, so I'm sure this was... Byron is one of the factors. I mean, we have found, whether it's in crashes uh, or... For example, this is Evo, Evo Knievel. Knievel. Uh, he was on an emotional critical day. Uh, when he had this accident, when he was trying to jump over the sharks. And anybody who had uh, uh, read uh, my book uh, or had uh, read a month before he did the Snake River Canyon, I warned him. I said that that was a critical day, and that too was a critical day for mm -hmm, him. Mm -hmm. uh, in sports, we find uh, Mark Spitz. He won his seven awards when he was emotionally and physically high, not intellectually, because a swimmer ha shouldn't think, as a matter of fact. He just has to go like mad. Exactly correct. And uh, Fran Talkington at the uh, Minnesota... Um, <laughs> Fran didn't have a prayer. No, did he? he didn't have a prayer. I, in fact, uh, I hosted a show with him uh, for uh, NBC Grandstand, and mm -hmm. we uh, picked uh, uh, Guy Berger. Well, wait, let me ask you something about, about him. Okay. When you did the show with him, was he aware that you had this chart? Well, I did the show with him when we did Al Guy, the uh, Greensboro Classic, mm -hmm. where I selected Guy Berger and Trevino were coming first and second. Uh, and he's well aware of biorhythms. And uh, I believe that Fran believed that the team would win. And uh, when we did the charts uh, of the Raiders and the Vikings, of all the individual players, it was no surprise, and the, I released the story to the press, how I thought the Vikings would lose, because here we see the Vikings, they were all uh, low. Uh, the entire defense team, the, the front uh, four, we're all low, and if you examine the individual players, there's no surprise that they did not do well. Mm -hmm. Now, we find this, uh, it's interesting, uh, where you uh, use this in sports. Now, here's a, a, a prime example. Uh, Jack Nicklaus, uh, last year, coming in almost last at the uh, Pebble Beach Tournament, one of our greatest players. Now, uh, 
Nastassi, when he blew up and used obscene language. Mm -hmm. He was almost on a, uh, he was critical, emotional. Uh, this was a day that uh, he just blew his core. And then again, again, I want to emphasize to those who joined late, the key thing here is not the lows and highs, but these in the middle where things are out of control. They're out of control. Uh, lows and highs have their functions. Now, one of the things uh, I'd like to get to yourself. Before we do, let me ask you something. Go ahead. If people find out when they are getting into periods of difficulty, should they become despondent? Should they despair? Give Not up? at all. Not at What's all. The I, think, I think it's like driving a car. You wouldn't want to drive a car without any instruments. It's good to know that your gas is down or your, your battery is not charging. Uh, it's a warning to you. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, let me do your own shot. Yes, sir. I hate to have things done on me because I hate to pump myself, but you did this so well. I, I did this, and I did your chart. And today, you are emotionally and intellectually high, mm -hmm. and physically, you're low. I felt rotten all week. Your energy is way down yep. right here. Now, if you look on for the next month, you will see how you will be going up and down. And I see here at the end of March, a wonderful period. Yeah, but about March, rough period. March 15th is not, not going to be one of the great days. No, March 15th is going to be emotionally <laughs> and physically well. Now, for example, one of the interesting things is if I put in today's date uh, into this Cosmos computer and uh, put in your birthday uh, and uh, at the same time put in your um, Bruce, your producer. My producer, Bruce right. McKay. Uh, 422, and uh, here we are. Now, by pressing this button right here, mm -hmm. Uh, I see that physically you're 13, that you are not, uh, when you're up and he's not up, physically. Emotionally, you have a 71 quotient. In other words, when you're feeling good, uh, he's um, feeling good. Right. And when he's down, you're down. Intellectually, your numbers would be 45. And that would mean that you're almost the same. Most of the time, when you are bright, he's bright. Mm -hmm. When you're a little sluggish, he's... You know what's funny? When this show does well, he and I are in sync. Mm -hmm. When we go in the tank, we know we're going in the tank. We <laughs> tell each other we're going in the tank, and we go in the tank. Well, the e easy thing is, if you have this little gadget, uh, this computer, uh, and you press, for example, I have your birthday, I have his birthday in here, and I go and press the button, this red light will come up and say, it's going to be a critical day. Mm -hmm. uh, be careful. I can go forwards, I can go backwards. And I could put in every birthday of every person on your staff. And then each time I, with this uh, Cosmos calculator, be able to tell whether this is going to be a tough day for you. What or days we're in day. sync or what right. days we're not in sync. It makes it easier for you to cope. There are times you know you get along better with some of your staff. That's your or <laughs> with your guests. Okay. That's your life. Other times it's very rough. Uh huh. Now you had a very rough day today. <laughs> yes, been difficult. Uh, so, I think one of the uh, fascinating things about biorhythm is that we are getting reports from universities uh, who are now studying biorhythm and proving that there is a relationship between biorhythm, we'll say, and learning curves. It's easier to teach retarded children when they're intellectually high than when they're intellectually low. Uh, people who've had heart attacks, uh, most of them have occurred on critical days. Uh, I myself am addressing six medical conventions this year. This is the first time that biorhythm has been taken very seriously. Oh, no, the profession is now beginning to come around on that. I've read uh, reports yes. and accounts, uh, in, even in the news magazines. Well, where they say Tom, the reason to for it is for up to now, you had to know trigonometry to do biorhythm or to use, calcul uh, use uh, heavy computers. My book, Biorhythm, A Personal Science, made it easy to chart. Now a, a calculator comes out and you put it in your pocket, carry it around with you, and with this cosmos, you could do your buyer of them and anybody else's buyer of them. And I think if you're a salesman or a teacher or a doctor, you are learning how to cope by knowing the facts because we all have our ups and downs. There's a period coming up which may not be good for me. I better be on my toes. I'll get through it okay, but That's right. I, I better pay attention to what's going on. I'm awfully glad you came in here oh, tonight. To and I, may I keep this chart you because I want to and take I, it. I'd, I'd like you to tell your audience whether it worked or not. I'm going to put the chart on the wall in the office, and I'll be prepared. Thank you very much, Mr. Pleasure. Gittleson. All right, my pleasure, too. We will continue then and talk with uh, 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 the, uh, yeah, I know the man's name. I want to tell the author of 
Report from Engine Company 82, Mr. Dennis Smith, right after these words from our affiliated stations. Now here's Mr. Dennis Smith, who we called very late in the day and said, please come in, and he was kind enough to do that, and I'm most appreciative of that, Mr. Smith. Well, I'm, I'm glad to be here. If you would call me Dennis, I will. I'd be even happier. Dennis is the best-known firefighter in this <clears throat> country. His first book, which I've already mentioned, Report from Engine Company 82, has sold over a million copies. His second book, The Final Fire, has been sold to a television network. In spite of his success as an author, he still maintains his job as a fireman at Ladder Company 61 in the Bronx, one of the toughest places to work in the world as a firefighter. In his spare time, he's working on a third book. He's also started the first national magazine for firemen called Firehouse. He believes that fighting fires is possibly the most dangerous occupation in the United States. And I wouldn't argue with that. I had a fire at my house here in New York a little over a year ago, and I wasn't here for it, but I'm told what those guys go through when they go in the door is absolutely unbelievable. What is it like? Well, I'll tell you, it, it's, uh, let me say first that it, it's, it's not that I say it's the most dangerous thing. It's a, it's a dubious distinction, but it is true that the National uh, Safety Council and the National um, uh, Labor Council say that uh, firefighting is the most dangerous of all professions. Uh, thereafter, it's firefighting first, then mining, underground mining, then oil mining, then oil construction work. Mm -hmm. And uh, then other police, for instance, would be below that. We just lose more statistically. It's, uh, it's what is it like when you walk in the door or chop through the roof? Dirty. It's yeah. very dirty. It's very hot. Very smoky. You can't see. Um, uh, it's it's physically debilitating. You know, smoke, of course, is does nothing for your longevity. It it you know it it, it assaults you. Uh, the body reacts to it. Uh, you can't see, and you're very disoriented. But yet, you you know, within this this hostile environment, you you, you create calls, and you and you and you go about intelligently to. What is the first thing you want to do when you get in there? I suppose find out look, if there's anybody inside. Sure. Look, victims is the is you know to to find a victim is the, is the fundamental responsibility of all firefighters. I mean, life saving. Thereafter, property. Uh, but you do many things. I mean, you, you, you know, you, there's a group, that we work in teams. There's a group who's doing hose work, and then there's another group who's doing laddering work and ventilation work. And, and, uh, and it's all being coordinated because if, you, if, you, uh, if there's a fire and if you um, turn the hose, if you, if you ventilate the windows, that is, break the windows before the hose is filled with water, you're just going to oxygenate the fire and it's going to spread that much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So you have to coordinate it pretty well. Mm -hmm. Why isn't the water running when you go in the door out the nozzle? It is, normally. I'd always uh, heard that you wait till you get inside <clears throat> before you blast, that you kind of want to get... Oh, I see, uh, running. Right. That is why, yeah, yeah, why is the nozzle not open? Well, because it creates uh, water damage, number one, and number two, it's ineffective. I mean, what, what does it do? You have to see the fire, and once you see the fire, then the water becomes effective. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, other, and it's easier to move the hose with the nozzle closed. So you, you would pull the hose to the entrance of, the, of an apartment, say, and, uh, and then you would crawl into that apartment with the hose, and uh, once you got to the, to the fire, as close you, as you could get to it, then you just turn the nozzle on and extinguish the fire. Knowing all the dangers that firefighters face, uh, knowing that, uh, that personal injury is uh, often the rule rather than the exception, mm -hmm. why do young men and now, in some cases, young women pursue this career. Why did you do it? Well, <clears throat> I, think it's a, I think it's a job. They're, they're, they're <clears throat> of course, paid and volunteer firefighters. <clears throat> Volunteers do it, I think, because they have a sense of, of uh, community service. And, and paid men, I, I think, do it. Well, a generalization is most firefighters are other directed. I think that they're service-oriented people. But in, in the large city departments, they do it because it's a job. It's, you know, when I was a kid, I was born and raised in the tenements over here in the, in the 50s, before the East 50s of New York became Shishi. And uh, 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 adults in my neighborhood... What about the East 50s? 56, oh. between first and second. Okay. And it's, it's parking lot now. The, 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 all, all the memories of my youth are in this mm -hmm. parking lot over there. But in any case, the, uh, the adults in that, in that neighborhood remember the Depression years keenly, and they remember that the firemen and the cop on the block kept his job through those, through those tough years. And so there was this sense of economic security, and uh, that's, I think, what attracted me. I didn't have any terrific romantic 
ambitions. Uh, as it turns out, of course, it's not so economically secure anymore. I mean, we laid off a thousand firemen uh, a year ago last June, but uh, happily they've all been rehired. So the economic security was it for you, the fact that you knew yeah. there would be Except a job then, there. then when you become a fireman, you become a part of the tradition, you, 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 you understand the men that you work with, then your perception of the thing changes. You know, it, it's, it's less than economic security, although it's important because most firemen have wives and families. <clears throat> but, the, you know, there's a, there's a sense of, of uh, you get up in the morning and you like yourself. That's easy. Firemen like what they do. It's got all the difficulties and dangers. And I think in Engine Company uh, uh, 82, Dennis, you wrote about your mm -hmm. first fire when you went out to your first one. Mm -hmm. What was that like? Well, it was just um, as, when I first became a fireman, I was working out in Queens. And it was a fire in a, you know, just a two-story building. And there was a man killed. He was, he was killed on a... Um, by smoke inhalation, not by the fire. And it was a fire that affected me because it was a, a fatal fire. The, the thing about it is that, uh, and that's 14 years ago now, Tom. Uh, the thing about it is that uh, had we had a smoke detector then, had we had a smoke detector now, uh, you know, those things would just, would have saved that man's life. And, uh, as I understand it, very few people in this country, even with the national campaigns of these big, big companies yeah, now that make them, the big now. advertising campaigns by companies, but the, the smoke detectors aren't selling as well as they should be. And I'll tell you, it's like, to me, if, if someone offered me a machine to put in the car that was going to beep a little thing 10 seconds before I was going to crash into another car, you know, I'd pay a couple thousand dollars for that machine if it worked. Well, that's what a smoke detector does. And they cost, I guess, about... Uh... I guess you can spend anywhere from 25 to 40 bucks for the battery-operated ones that Definitely. you put outside your bedroom door. Which are very good, very efficient. Mm -hmm. Tell the story about the, uh, not that I want to harp on smoke detectors, but uh, the girl that was <clears throat> taking the shower when the fire started in the kitchen next door. That was recent, yeah. That was, um, uh, and it turned out to be a fireman's niece, a guy that uh, I know very well in the Bronx. Uh, she was a girl, 16 years old. She was taking a shower, and uh, she stepped out of the shower and, and uh, opened the door and was met by smoke and, and uh, heat, and, but she was naked. And uh, instead of running quickly to the front door and getting out of the place, which she could have done, as we surmised, and she ran into the, into, the, into the room directly next to the kitchen to get a robe to or get something. a robe or something and in that room uh, there was no fire in that room but the heat was so uh, intense that the television and the, and the radio in the room the plastic casings had just melted and, uh, and so she ran into this this, this this pocket of superheated gases and uh, and then went unconscious and we worked on our uh, uh, cardiac pulmonary resuscitation for about 25 minutes till the doctor came and said it's hopeless. And, mm -hmm. and again, it's a good illustration of where a smoke detector If there had been one in the hallway sure. outside, you hear the thing go Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Even in the shower, you can hear these things. They, you know, they're and when up. you hear it go off, I have them in my place now because uh, mm -hmm. I've been burned once. And I tell people who might uh, stay with me, my daughter if she's in or uh, people at the house when I'm not there, if you hear it, don't look for the fire. Get the hell out of there. Just yes. get out of there and call the fire department. There's no sense looking around. Don't take anything. Don't look for... Uh, don't take anything. Mm. When you saw that first fire, and it was a fatal fire, at that point, did the thought cross your mind, I don't want to do this anymore? I want to get out of this? <clears throat> no. I, I didn't have those kind of options. It, it was still a job. Mm -hmm. Don't forget that. Fundamental to, the, to this thing. You know, I'm, an, I'm a, a, a kid from the east side of New York, and... and uh, at that time, I, uh, I'd gotten out of the service. I quit high school when I was 16 years old. Gotten out of the service, uh, just began going to New York University. And uh, it was my freshman year there when I became a fireman. I continued there for 10 years until I got a master's degree. Uh, but I didn't have the option to say, oh, this is tough mm -hmm. work and, you know, what well, are you going to do? You have the option to say it now and you're still doing it. I mean, you'll have to make yeah. a decision someday, but uh, you still keep that... That foothold there, that touch with reality. Yeah. I have paused for these words from our sponsors. We will continue with uh, Dennis right after these messages. What do firefighters think 
when a crowd gathers around the fire just to watch it? What do they think of people watching fires? Well, <clears throat> they, I think fire, I think firefighters think that's pretty normal. What, 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 uh, what, uh, what's interesting to me is to have a huge fire in a tenement in South Bronx and having people walk by it without turning their heads because they've been so conditioned to this, you know, yeah, yeah. Just, and to see fire engines going, you know, wailing, careening through the streets and have people won't turn their heads because well, they're I so used to, to it. I was going from here, I was going down to Macy's or Gimbel's or someplace to shop one afternoon here, and uh, so I got down to about 43rd, 42nd, 41st Street, turned the corner. There was a fire in a commercial building, topless joint, uh, uh, some kind of a uh, studio above our studio. And the building, the fire, the flame was over, the smoke was coming out. The guys are going in with the axes now to make sure everything's out. Well, you couldn't walk down the street. People are standing, and look and look and look. I thought to myself, what compels people to stop and look at this? Yeah. That was, it reminds me of an interesting story. <clears throat> uh, when, when the, you know, back in, in, the, uh, in the teens before the war, when they tried to bomb Jay Gould out of his office down on Wall Street. Do you remember that? No, I'm sorry, I don't. Well, the, the, there was a, a, a bombing by anarchists, as it turned out, and uh, some fire, but not a significant fire. But they had um, a terrible problem with the crowds. And people were trampled and near rioting just because people were rubbernecking. You know? um, I think it's pretty normal for, 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 for people to watch firemen. I mean, you know, there is, there is a projection, I guess, of personality. Surely. You know, one, one says, gee, I wonder what it's like to be up on that ladder. I wonder what it's like to to be in that particular uniform walking around with an axe in your hand or something. And it's a, firefighting is a colorful, and, and it's also very American. In, in, and there's in a certain a, amount know, of, a, as you say, romance. Yeah. And, uh, but the job itself, I and mean, if, if those onlookers know what it's like to go into a smoky, hot room and then... I would think... And I, dirty. Yeah, and okay. I think the thing that must be awful is having to clean it up afterwards when everything is all yucky and you've got to wind the hoses and re-rig the ladders and... Get well, up. this is in, perhaps in questionable taste, but I'll tell you in any case. And that is, at, you know, after work, the, what you have to do is soak up your fingers um, an awful lot and then just shove them up your nostrils. <clears throat> and um, just what? to clean that... Oh, get all that gook out. Yeah, yeah. uh, you know, the wall is soot in the inside of your nose. It's... There is some concern since this movie came out, The Towering Inferno, about the safety of living in high-rise buildings, mm -hmm. working in them. Uh, what thoughts do firefighters have on that? I've heard, for example, in New York, people say, I wouldn't live above the seventh floor because that's as high as the ladders go. Good idea. Really? Good idea. I, um... Uh, listen, I guess statistically you're as you know, you're as better off on the 40th floor as you are on the third floor of a tenement, okay? The point is, though, that, that high-rises are not very fire-safe. Uh, you know, they have, they still in New York have heat-touch elevator buttons. Our, our, um, um, the legislation that we put through the city council two years ago, we had to have a big, tough fight to, to have um, compartmentalization in buildings so the fire wouldn't spread was, uh, you know, was just down by the city council and, and put off for another 10 years or so. The, um, uh, um, there's no way out. And, and, and New York particularly. In Chicago, at least, they, you know, in all their high-rise buildings, they require helipads. They have a helicopter firefighting squad in Chicago. That does wonderful work. We don't have that in New York. We don't, the fire department doesn't have a helicopter. Although we have a lot of pilots in the fire department. Uh, uh, the problem is egress. You know, where do you go get out, when right. there is a when there's there a is problem? A fire? Get out, close the door behind you. In high-rise buildings, that those things that we call fireproof buildings are not at all. Fire, you know, it's presumptuous to call anything fireproof or earthquake-proof. Sure, but they're resistant in some in some ways. Sure, at the, the after the fire, you'll see this. You know, almost almost Rodin-like sculpture. You know, of of of, uh, of a skeleton beams still standing. But of course, everything in it is just burned away. And so consequently, you can call the building fireproof because that skeleton is still there. Nothing. What do you think about women firefighters? You know, I had a big thing in San Diego. We did something on that a couple, two, three years yeah. ago. Yeah, those, those women didn't make it, you know. they, they uh, Washed back? They, yeah, they, they were, I think three of them got through the original stages. And uh, then they were washed out. There, is, there are a couple uh, paid uh, women firefighters working in the firehouse that I know of. 
One is in Washington, one is in Baltimore. What do you think of the concept, Dennis? Well, I, my feeling about it is, I, I've talked to a lot of firemen's wives about this, and I've talked <laughs> to women who are genuinely, genuinely concerned about being firefighters. My feeling about it was, <clears throat> you know, that if the women of Russia could build the Moscow Soviet subway system, I guess, I guess they could fight fires. If, if I have a person next to me, and, and, and I fall down in that fire, I just want that person to be able to lift me up and get me out of there. That's, that's what I ask. All right. You were quoted in the Penthouse article as saying that uh, most politicians are liars and or thieves. Unfortunately, there wasn't room in, in that to expand. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure when we taped that interview whether I did in fact expand upon it. I didn't said it, of course. And the thing is that uh, I believe that be because there's no change. You see? I have worked in the, in the ghettos of this city, and I've seen the ghettos of other cities the last 14 years, and there has been no stopping. I mean, there's continual retrogression. So for a politician to get up and say, this is what we got to do, and this is how we got to turn the city around, and these are the programs that I'm offering, and you see, all well, during those years, constant retrogression, retrogression you got to ask, you know, what, what are they, when I say thieves, I'm, they're taking salary, you know, for offering programs that are supposed to help, and they're programs, of course... Uh, and making promises, which... Which, don't help, which they, they keep. It's bulwark, you know? Uh, there might be some hope. I don't know. I mean, don't forget that, that, that there's been a Republican administration for most of the years. I've been a fireman. Uh, maybe a new Democratic administration will put some money back into the cities, and uh, it'll take a lot more than that here in New York, of course. Who's your audience for this magazine, the Firehouse, do you think? Well, we now have over 80,000 subscribers, and we're, we're, uh, the, the audience is firefighters and their families, and that's what pleases me. This is an idea I had... Ten years ago, there's, there's no magazine to serve the interests of firefighters. But more importantly, even those trade and technical magazines that come into the house if you're a fireman, you know, the wives and the kids don't want to read it. They're not interested. But the firehouse magazine is being read equally by the, by the firefighter's wife and, and his kids, and that pleases me. It's a non-technological, consumer-oriented, you know, lifestyle magazine. Mm -hmm. And it's beautiful. It's full color, and I'm, I'm very pleased. I spend most of my time there now. When I'm not, I still work 40 hours a week in the firehouse. But when I'm not in the firehouse, I'm either at the magazine or at home. No time for fun these days. No, I know. There's, so, there seldom is when uh, people try to do as much as you're doing. Do you have smoke detectors in your house? Oh, sure. And Where ladders. They go? Rope ladders. Let's hope they never go off. Hope so. Thank you very much, Dennis, for being with us. Thank tonight. you. Continued Tom, good pleasure. luck and success to you. I really enjoyed meeting you. Thank you again for coming on very short notice. Yeah. We will continue right after these words from our sponsors and or affiliated stations. Dr. Ronald Erickson is a gentleman who says there is a way to greatly increase the chances your baby will be a boy if you so desire. He is a biologist who for years has been involved in helping people have children. He'll explain how he does that and how he can artificially inseminate male sperm cells and greatly increase the chances that if a man or woman desire their child to be a male, it will be. It almost sounds like 1984, Doctor. That's only eight years away. I know it is. Uh, would it be a good idea to show the film right here at the beginning and have you describe what that is so we know what we're talking about, how you are able to separate the Y cells in, in uh, human semen so that there is a greater possibility of there being a male child? I think an explanation is in order first. All right, an explanation first. Three things we're involved with. Started out to select for the Y chromosome, which produces the male as compared to the X, because in mammals you have two sex chromosomes, the X and the Y, as they're called. And the research showed that when you swim sperm through a vertical column, which is viscous, in this case, human serum albumin, you end up in the bottom of the column with more Y-bearing sperm than X-bearing sperm. But we also found out at the same time that you end up with most of the sperm which are the best swimmers. So it's an elimination process of the dead, the wounded, and the undesirable. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we got to thinking perhaps this would be have benefit for the clinically infertile male, speaking of humans now. In other words, take his semen sample, which normally wouldn't be used for insemination because of the poor quality, or they'd either adopt or go to donor insemination, see if we couldn't, in quotes, clean up his semen and select the best sperm that that particular male had for insemination. So this was somewhat of a 
side effect of the original work. They can do two things. You can either go into a more complex process and end up with, say, the maximum of 85 or 90 percent of the sperm in the final fraction, which have the Y chromosome, most of which are motile, or you can take the infertile male in a less complex procedure and markedly improve the swimming ability, and also these sperm are the most normal based on their shape. And this particular uh, piece of film shows a subfertile male. And you can show it now. Uh, but I just want to ask you what the word motile means. Motile means swimming, mobile, but in it's used biologically as motile and non-motile. So you base it on percentage and also on the progressiveness, that is how fast they move forward. All right, let's take a look then at the film. It runs about a minute and 30 seconds, and Dr. Erickson here will tell us what we're seeing. This is like a chemistry lab. Yes, that is raw semen from a subfertile male, and we estimated that 20% of his sperm are moving. And you can, if you look, you see that there are a lot of the sperm that are not moving, mm -hmm. and also there's a lot of debris, in other words, background matter, which normally you wouldn't have in a normal male. And what we did is we layered these sperm over the top of a column, and this is, right at this point, you can see uh, the dredges, in other words, what's left over. This is the part we would throw out. And you can see also that the motility is dramatically uh, decreased, not because we've killed the sperm, but because most of the motile sperm has swam out due to gravity and their ability to swim. And the final fraction here, you can see, is considerably improved. The background matter has been removed, and uh, we've changed it from a 20% of the sperm moving to 80%. And also you can see the progressiveness, that is their ability to move forward, has improved. Not because we've done something spectacular to the sperm, but we've selected out the best swimmers, what I call the gold medal winners. Or as dealing with your program, maybe these have got rhythm, biorhythm. <laughs> Look at those guys. I don't know whether they're up or they're down or whether they're intellectually on or physically down, but these must be up at this moment. Now, we have uh, some slides, I think, that will give us some indication of the difference between the XX and the XY, will we not? Uh, the yes. And y. Excuse yes. Me. It's, uh, it's after conception that it's XX. Well, XY. there's an interesting point here, and in, in all of the million species, with the exception of the gorilla, and I don't know any biologists that are willing to collect semen from gorillas, uh, you have to deal with humans. And, uh, you know how you do that, by the way. No, very <laughs> carefully. <laughs> I don't at all. The, the point being is that no other laboratory or domestic mammal can you identify the Y chromosome. But some Swedish workers, almost a decade ago now, they found a staining procedure which identified the Y chromosome, so which allowed all this work to take place. Otherwise, you'd have to inseminate and do uh, uh, wait for the offspring and sex that. Let's take a look at the... Uh... If you notice in the, the rounded part, that is the head, and there's a bright dot on some of those, a small part, which is fluorescing much brighter. These are sperm with a fluorescent microscope, and those with the dot are the Y chromosomes. And out of that particular sample, there are two which do not have the Y chromosome, and they would be the X. And if they penetrated the ovum, you would have a female, or if the others, you would have a male. And you notice there that this, there's no background matter. There's a larger example. That bright, small dot in the middle of the head Surely. is part of the Y chromosome. Mm -hmm. So you can see under laboratory conditions whether or not you have an X or a Y-bearing sperm. Have, Only in humans. Have you had a chance to measure results of this program yet? Yes, we have done uh, some work. Uh, clinically and also the first thing you do in the scientific community particularly in this area because it has low credibility is for other people to attempt to repeat the same work which has been done in enough times now that I think uh, there isn't really much of a question there will always be a question until you have substantial data but it's, it's not something that people are looking at as a mystical sort of thing okay but the clinical work is now underway but it's being done primarily with infertile couples, and there have been children born on three continents. What percentage have been male? Uh, most of them have been for the infertility, and we weren't going for the I sex. Understand. I and, understand. And uh, the numbers, there has been boys, and there was one girl born, too. I understand. I must pause for these words. We're from our sponsors. We'll be right back uh, after these messages.
Joining us now is Dr. Joseph Felcher, who is the medical director of IDENT Corporation, the largest commercial sperm bank in the world. Dr. Felcher and his company are in the business of collecting, storing, and supplying human sperm for the purpose of artificial insemination. What kinds of people uh, deposit in your bank? Well, for storage purposes, there are two main categories. One are men who are about to have a vasectomy and want to have a, an additional form of insurance in case they change their mind and wish to have additional children. The other main type in our bank, we're the main repository for men in the United States who are having medical treatment which will sterilize, mostly men who have cancer, curable types of cancer. Mm -hmm. So they store. I mean, we have men coming from all over the country for that purpose. How long uh, is sperm viable when it's put in your bank? Probably indefinitely. No Re one really well, knows. Do you freeze it or put it in a solution? or how does it's, it it's kept at about minus 350 degrees in liquid nitrogen. At that temperature, almost all life is suspended. All chemical activity is suspended. And at Cornell, they've shown that after five years, there's practically no change in the uh, viability of the sperm. It's very important, though, that you keep the sperm in a really carefully monitored environment. I was just thinking about, uh, is it cryonics? The freezing of the body after death? With cryogenics. The cryogenics with the hope that one day it can be brought back uh, when the cure for the disease which yeah. killed the person to begin with is known. Uh, if they can keep sperm for five years, you wonder if they may be very... They really can't. Uh, the body... the. Sperm cells are really unique, or cells are unique. You can keep a single cell viable, probably indefinitely, but you, no one has succeeded in keeping large groups of cells viable uh, in a frozen state, and that's probably unrealistic. Mm -hmm. the, the main function, really, of a sperm bank is not only the storage of sperm, but also, in terms of infertility, uh, to to provide donor sperm for infertile men. I don't know if you're aware of it, but 10% of all the men in this country are either sterile or semi-sterile. And because of the abortion laws in this country, you've got a great problem developing in the sense that there are many couples who want children who can't have them. And a sperm bank really provides an opportunity at least for correction of the male infertility problem, not the female infertility problem. That, that, in that it could possibly replace the orphanage and the foster homes when there is no supply of children? Well, in the sense that when a woman is infertile, usually the situation is very complex and there are a large number of possible therapies. When a male is sterile, the, the problems may be man, uh, multiple, but at least you can treat this problem by finding a donor that matches the father. Under these circumstances, a woman can have a natural child which closely resembles the father. Now, she will never know, in fact, who the father is, though. Will she? Well, she may. She, no, she will not know who the donor is. As a matter of fact, we know there are at least 50,000 children born by so-called artificial insemination in the United States. Most of that sperm is from fresh semen. That's where the doctor obtains a donor, gets the fresh semen, and inseminates the woman. That's not the most desirable method, because obviously that depends on your having a man available who's available at a convenient time, etc. cetera. Uh, chances, for example, of getting someone who looks like you, who's available at that time when the woman is first... Who's ready. Who's ready is <laughs> not too high. But if we wanted to match someone up who looks like you, if we're willing to wait a number of months, we'll get someone who looks just like you and has the right characteristics of sperm. What is the going rate for donors these days? The donors are paid $20, and the physicians... By the way, the semen is shipped in liquid nitrogen to the physicians. The physicians order the sperm from the sperm bank. And they do not know the donors, and the sperm bank does not know the recipient. This is very important in terms of assuring privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be interested to know that sperm banks by themselves have been uh, unsuccessful commercially. And I was responsible in 1974 for saving IDENT, which was the largest bank in the world as part of a reorganization. I am five other physicians gave our time free of charge uh, to help save it. What do you think of uh, Dr. Erickson's plan here for uh, sex selection? I think that Dr. Erickson's idea is one in which a number of people are working. Uh, I think Dr. Erickson has a distance to go to prove his point. I think if he does, if he can prove... I think he would agree with that. Uh, I, think, I, think, I think that uh, if a method is found of choosing sex, it'll have revolutionary implications, really tremendous. 
because I think most people want boys, not girls. Oh, I think people who have boys want girls and girls. I hope it, I hope it always stays that way. <laughs> My time is gone. Thank you very much for being with us tonight, both of you gentlemen, and I appreciate your coming in on short notice. If, if you did, I'm very confused about who's here, who's supposed to okay. be in the game. Like, we'll be